Coming up on Colonial Crossfire. Talks with North Korea. Turnover at the White House. And more turnover at the White House. Joining us on the left, Levi DeBose. And on the right, Diego Rublar. And I'm your moderator, Casey Decker, from the GWTV studios in Washington, D.C. This is Colonial Crossfire. It's chaos in the Trump administration. In the past few weeks, the Secretary of State, White House Communications Director, National Security Advisor, Chief Economic Advisor, and Deputy FBI Director have all resigned or been fired. It's so much, we're devoting two blocks to it today, but it also comes amidst major developments in foreign affairs where our student panel will begin their debate, and here they are. On the left, we have Levi DeBose, a junior from Houston, Texas, majoring in political science. Levi is the former communications director of GW College Democrats. And on the right, Diego Rublar, a sophomore from San Jose, California, majoring in political science. Diego is an executive board member of GW Young America's Foundation and the former chairman of California Teens for Crews. Thanks to both of you for joining us. No problem. Saying a lot has happened in the past few weeks would be an understatement. So here's how we'll break it down. We'll begin with foreign policy, then after the break, talk about the White House turnover with primarily domestic implications. The biggest policy announcement this month was that President Trump has agreed to meet with North Korean dictator Kim Jong-un. And according to leaders in the U.S. and South Korea, the North Korean nuclear program won't just be on the table, it'll be the focal point of the conversation. So let's start with the most basic question. Levi, are these meetings a good idea? I think the question may be basic, but it's really complex from the beginning. I think the idea of meetings are good. Negotiations, talk, peace talks are always a good thing. But my concern comes with the lack of preparation beforehand. I think that when you look at every other peace talk that has been done at least since FDR, there has been at least some level of beginning opening round negotiations. With the president and Kim Jong-un, that doesn't appear that it will happen. Um, so I'm very concerned that the president doesn't have the right staff in order to hold those opening round open negotiations. He doesn't actually want to hold those open round negotiations, and he just wants to have the fun part, which is hopefully not a televised appearance with a dictator. Diego, do you share those concerns? I, I think that he, the president, has shown a willingness to, to try to work on this issue. I don't think he's just doing this for a photo op. I think that he's been very open about um, being very willing to find a solution to a problem that has plagued American foreign policy, quite frankly, for you know decades before he took office. And I think that um, there is some concern with some staff turnover that he might, you know, there might be some some uh, turmoil in the, in the turnover. But I think that you know he has specifically said that he's going to wait till Secretary of State designate uh, Pompeo is um, in office, and Nikki Haley, I'm sure, is going to be working with him and his whole foreign policy team. So um, I think these are really good ideas. I think that there is. Um, been a, a lot of movement in recent um, months towards a more open uh, relationship between North Korea and the United States and South Korea and um, its neighbors. I think this is a, probably a um, once in an administration and perhaps a once in a decade opportunity for the president to um, negotiate with Kim Jong-un and hopefully make some progress on an issue which quite frankly um, has bipartisan concern and I think both parties would have some support for finding a solution. Now what do you think the U.S. should demand from North Korea during these talks? I think there sh should be some discussion on you know, ways to scale back the nuclear program. I, you know, Key has, North Korea has been very, has been very um, aggressive in recent months. You see that's uh, toned down recently. I think um, you, know, you obviously don't want to go for a home run. You don't need to go for a home run on the first try. I think that this is a good uh, first step. I think this is a good building point. I think this is a good um, jumping off point to have future talks and future summits. Um, I think just getting um, a good relationship going and some open dialogue is a good first step to progress being made. You seem to disagree. I do. Um, I think that when you're meeting with the dictator, a person who has you know, starved hundreds of thousands, we don't even know because there are no human rights violations checks, but thousands of people who has killed thousands of people, including his close relatives, you don't need to have some nice conversation to start, no. We need real results. We re need real answers. And the way to do that is not to have a nice one hour and 30 minute show sesh with the dictator. We don't need that. What we need, I would say the big four things that we need from this are you need to make sure that they are denuking. 
So you need that promise. You need to actually check that. You need to make sure that they do not invest in that and they start investing in their population again. And also you need to have human rights violators be able to come in and check to make sure that they are living up to the standard of any country in this modern world. It's not a time for just relaxing and having jokes and having fun with the dictator. No, we actually need a president who will tell the dictator what he needs to hear. You are doing an awful job and you're killing your people and we won't accept that as a man. And I, and I think it's very clear President Trump has done that. He has called out North Korea for its atrocious human rights violations. You know, I think it's pretty ironic. You, you say we shouldn't have this, this open dialogue. I mean, as President Obama did when he went to Cuba, you know, having some well, open dialogue. I think, you know, after President Trump has been very clear in a way that President Obama wasn't very clear in naming that North Korea is a human rights abuser. You know, Nikki Haley has been very clear as well. And I think that he's not going to go around and have some sort of, you know, happy dappy, you know, golf outing with, you know, a dictator. I think he's going to be serious. I think he's going to call out North, North Korean dictator for what he is. And I think he's going to make some progress in getting the results the American people expect and want. I think that it's not a bipartisan issue calling out North Korea for its awful human rights violations. The idea that President Obama did not call out North Korea for its human rights violations is a little absurd. Now, Levi, do you think that the talks will be at all productive? I hope so. Um, if they are productive, then hopefully they will lead to future meetings. If they are productive, hopefully they will lead to some reckoning from Kim Jong-un that maybe this won't go well. Um, unfortunately, how President Trump has handled the White House, I don't think that's how it's gonna go. And that unfortunately leads us to bigger concerns when it comes to if it is a bad meeting, what is the fallout? If it is a bad meeting, um, does it end up with the president congratulating dictators? Does it end up with the president going through and insulting Kim Jong-un in a way that makes Kim Jong-un want to start a war, which is something that South Korea nor Japan or anywhere in the Southeast Asian region uh, needs to deal with? So hopefully they go well. I, I really do hope so, um, because this is extremely high stakes. It is extremely high risk and I am extremely concerned with the direction that it's heading without any type of opening round negotiation. How do you think the talks will go? I, I think they'll go real well. I, I have confidence that you know the president will be prepared. He'll be prepared by his staff, and I think that I'm not expecting this to be you know some sort of landmark where we come out with a major agreement. But I think this will be a good first step towards making progress on an issue which I think the American people um, expect and demand progress. Now, when the president goes to meet with Kim, he'll have a brand new secretary of state in tow. After firing Rex Tillerson, Trump has nominated CIA director Mike Pompeo to fill the role. Here's the president on that decision. Quite well, but we disagreed on things. When you look at uh, the Iran deal, I think it's terrible. I guess he put, it was okay. I wanted to either break it or do something and he felt a little bit differently. So we were not really thinking the same. With Mike, Mike Pompeo, we have a, a very similar thought process. I think it's gonna go very well. Now, Diego, how will this change in Secretary of State position affect the Korea talks, in your opinion? Uh, I don't think it'll change very much. I think that, you know, as the president has said, made clear, um, there's going to be a time period um, to allow for, you know, the new designate to be confirmed and to be in office before um, we go through with these talks. And I think, um, notwithstanding, I think the president is also surrounded with, you know, incredible and very knowledgeable staffers, such as UN Ambassador Nick Haley, who's very knowledgeable. Um, I think that, obviously, it'll be a different dynamic. Um, it seems that uh, the president is a, on a closer personal level with um, Secretary of State designate Pompeo than he was with Rick Tillerson. Uh, I don't see it affecting the talks in a major way. I think that um, this will be, in the, in the end story, um, more of a you know minor footnote than a major headline. Levi, when it comes to Korea, are you more comfortable with Tillerson or Pompeo in this role? Well, first of all, just responding to that, I think that that would be true in just about any other administration. It would be true because the administration would have a deputy secretary of state. I don't know if Pompeo will have his deputy secretary of state in time, unless he, you know, reappoints Sean Sullivan in time. And then he would have assistant or, you know, assistant secretary of state. There are none because Trump just fired one on Twitter and the other one's left. Then you would say, oh, maybe an ambassador. So there's no ambassador to South Korea. So there is no staff, no important staff that you need to make sure that even when you have a change at the top, that the rest can be stable. So I'm very concerned about the talks under Tillerson or under Pompeo, even after if he wins a nomination. But that then brings us to the question of if Tillerson or Pompeo is better. I personally believe Tillerson is better. He was in the job. He was just getting used to it. He was in for around a year. And 
I think now getting to like three months. Um, he had a good a part of his staff in with him um, that he seemed to gel with, at least at the top lower levels, had um, reports that they had some concerns about him. Um, so at least he was beginning to gel and beginning to make amends to build a stronger State Department. Um, but even the stronger State Department that he built over the year has been incredibly weak. So I'm very concerned about what Pompeo will do. And I mean, I, I think that you touched on all about it. I think that there were some reported concerns amongst career officials in the State Department that, you know, Tellerson wasn't the guy they, they thought should be in the job. And I think that the president um, made a good decision to maybe shake things up at the State Department. Um, I think that the way things were wasn't exactly um, you know, best. There are a lot of concerns that the State Department wasn't at full manpower, as you, as you hinted at, um, because of some of Tillerson's preferences that he kept a lot of um, positions open at the State Department down here at Foggy Bottom. Um, remains to be seen, obviously, of the course of how Secretary of State designate uh, Pompeo ends up doing, but I, I do think that the president in this case made a move. I think uh, Tillerson was not very popular with conservatives to start with when he was nominated originally, um, and I am at least excited to see what Pompeo does in the job. So real quickly before we, we move on then, you think that Trump was justified in firing Tillerson the way he did? I, I think the manner of which the issue was handled um, was not the best. I think that the reports that I have seen as to how exactly the uh, deliverance of the news and how that was handled was not exactly how I would have personally handled it. Um, I think the decision was in itself a good one, but I do think that it could have been handled a lot better. Now, Tillerson isn't the only one out. Just yesterday, we learned that H.R. McMaster was outed as National Security Advisor, and he's been replaced with John Bolton. So first of all, Diego, how do you feel about having so much turnover in such key positions at such a critical time? I mean, I think it's obviously, I mean, change is not necessarily a bad thing. I, I think in the case of Mc, uh, McMaster and uh, John Bolton, um, I have some reservations about um, Bolton's uh, foreign policy views. Not that he's not qualified, obviously, after having served as an ambassador, but I have some concerns about his uh, interventionist leanings, to put it lightly. Um, not exactly what I would necessarily agree with him or think that the president necessarily campaigned on when he campaigned saying that we were going to you know, not be you know, the world's policeman anymore, not be intervening in those places. Um, I think that the turnover um, going forward, we'll see how these new people do in their jobs. I think that by and large, um, the scale and importance of you know some of these turnovers has been a little bit overplayed in the media. I think that it is um, good for juicy headlines. All this drama, you know, this uh, apprentice style, you know, Trump like, oh, you know, he's firing this, he's firing that, like you're fired. I think that plays well for ratings, but I think it distracts from a lot of the progress the president has made on the economy. I think it distracts from the great job the tax cuts are doing. Um, so I think it, by and large, a lot of this turnover has been blown out of proportion by the media, but I mean, sh but there sure is um, some concern with the announcement about Bolton. One more question to you, Olivia, before we go to break. Bolton, as Diego mentioned, has been unabashedly hawkish. He's promoted preemptive strikes in North Korea and Iran. Uh, so how do you think his promotion to this new position is going to affect the Korea talks? Well, number one, um, the staff turnover is not an underrated issue, but we'll talk about that later. Um, on Bolton, it concerns me that this is a person who has to go to the president as soon as any type of foreign policy crisis happens, and he's the first person to talk to the president. The reason why is because he has said, let's strike Iran, let's strike North Korea. So it'll be interesting to see how the president and John Bolton and maybe uh, doesn't Mike Pompeo will sit across the table from Kim Jong-un and Mike Pompeo can, or I'm sorry, Kim Jong-un can look at Mike Pompeo and John Bolton and say, oh, you were the guys who wanted to attack me. Oh, you were the guys who wanted to get me out of power and to destroy everything. Yeah, let's make a deal and let's be friends now. I don't think that's going to work. But, you know, in the dream world that Diego has, everything's going to be fine and the president's just going to work up a perfect deal and we live in this great world. I don't think so. All right, well, that is going to have to wrap up our discussion on foreign policy today, but we're not done yet. When we come back, even more administration turnover. The George Washington University, at the intersection of policy, practice, and research. Connecting all that Washington has to offer with an intellectual environment that drives progress. Transforming vision into action, offering learning experiences that are rigorous, real-time, and real-world. In a city shaping the future, George Washington is a place where faculty and students don't just study the world, they work to change it. It's on us. To stand up to those who tell us it's not our business. To tell our friends if what they're doing is wrong. It's on us. To do something. 
anything to keep an assault from happening. To be more than a bystander. To create an environment where women feel and are safe. It's on us to change the way we talk about women. To be part of the solution, not part of the problem. It's on us. To say something when our friends are being stupid. It's to hold our friends accountable for their actions. It's on us to, to look, look out, out for, for someone, someone who's had, who's too, had much too much to drink. drink. To step in if a friend is doing something that could lead to sexual assault. It's on us. To not give our friends a pass. To never blame the victim. To stop a sexual assault any way we can. I am a member of the George Washington University community, and it's on us to end sexual violence. We already mentioned Rex Tillerson and H.R. McMaster, but several other key people in the Trump administration have also been replaced in recent weeks. We'll start with Andrew McCabe, the deputy director of the FBI. Just two days before he was set to retire, he was fired. Here's Trump's tweet on the situation. Now, Attorney General Jeff Sessions was the one who actually fired McCabe. When he did, he released a statement which said McCabe was fired for leaking information about the Hillary email investigation to the press and then not being fully honest during the investigation into said leaks. Diego, was Sessions right to fire McCabe before he could retire? I, I think that the firing was just, I think that um, there has been a lot of characterization to make this as a purely political act. I think it's important to recognize that the investigation into uh, Mr. McCabe actually started from an inspector general position headed by an Obama appointee. Um, he was referred to an, the FBI Office of Personal Responsibility, which is headed by a Robert Mueller appointee. I think these, these are some career professionals from the DOJ, from the FBI, who all agreed that McCabe lacked candor, who had been dishonest, who um, deserved to be fired for his actions during the investigation, I think, and the, the person who actually recommended the firing to Attorney General Sessions, though he was the one who made the ultimate decision, was also a career DOJ official. So I think it, he was certainly justified, excuse me, certainly justified in his firing. And I think that um, as some people try to spin this in the media as a purely political stunt um, is both wrong and not rooted in any fact. Now, Levi, do you buy Sessions' justification for firing McCabe? I think that Sessions was justified to fire McCabe on those grounds. But the concern is, was McCabe fired on other grounds? Was the, what, you know, Secretary, I'm um, sorry, Attorney General Sessions said, was that true? There were reports that came up that showed that McCabe, when he was the acting FBI director, started an investigation on Sessions for his multiple lies during his committee hearing um, at the Judiciary Committee. So there's concern for me now that has been set due to these numerous reports that maybe Jeff Sessions didn't know more than he said about the Russia investigation, and maybe an investigation to him would be fruitful. So I hope uh, Special Counsel Mueller would start to at least look into that and do a preliminary look just to make sure that everything was followed in accordance with procedure. Quick response for you. I, I think it's very clearly, you know, he, he, it's very clear here, McCabe, you know, leaking more things to the media. I think there is no basis in, I think, these unnamed reports that, you know, we talk about Jeff Sessions, there are other reports. Um, I think this is just more of the same and it further justifies the reason he was fired. I think that um, leaking a lot of information to the press, I think it's being continued now, unfortunately, to try to drag other administration officials into whether it be Robert Mueller's investigation or other investigations. I think that uh, this unfortunately shows that the Attorney General and the career officials at the FBI and the DOJ were justified in showing that unfortunately Mr. McCabe did not lack the character or decision making necessary to remain in this position. Don't worry, there are a lot of people in the Trump administration that are already going under the Mueller probe, so you don't have to worry about anybody else being dragged in because I think they took up everyone. All right, moving quickly now, we mentioned before CIA Director Mike Pompeo is being promoted to Secretary of State, so who will replace him at the CIA? Well, the President wants Gina Haspel, the current Deputy Director, and a career spy to fill the role. She's been lauded by former Bush and Obama officials alike, but also been criticized by both parties for her involvement with torture and with covering up evidence of torture. Rand Paul has said he will filibuster her nomination. Diego, do you trust Gina Haspel? I think that we need to wait through the confirmation process to see um, what the you know, Judicial Committee ends up um, you know, asking what they find. I think that there was a report that Senator Paul had actually mentioned when he initially came out against her, which the website had since retracted, saying that she was happy and uh, celebrating torture. I think that it is obviously needs to be looked at what exactly her role was in these programs and what her opinion is now um, in such an important position as the CIA director. I think she's definitely qualified. I think she's held important positions. Like you said, she has bipartisan support. 
but I do think she needs to go through a robust confirmation process where um, you know the Senate holds her accountable for her past views, her past actions, and what her actions and views would be going forward if she is confirmed to lead what is a very powerful agency. Levi, well, same question to you. Do you trust Gina Haspel? Well, I don't like the way that Diego uses the word qualified. You know, when someone is qualified, that means they have the job experience, but that means they also follow the rule of law, American law and international law. I'm extremely concerned with Gina Haspel's um, alleged involvement in torture rings. I think that there needs to be a full investigation come by when we get to the hearing process, and it needs to be fully, fully looked into. And that means that if there are any unanswered questions, that the nomination is rescinded. Because when you actually have someone that's qualified, that means that the legal system says that they are good to go. They have a clean slate. Gina Haspel does not until she answers some questions. So hopefully she answers some questions. Hopefully she shows that um, either she was involved in these or her mind has radically changed and has actions to prove that her mind has radically changed or that she wasn't involved at all. Take and a 10, I don't think 10 response either. before we move on. I think it's innocent until proven guilty. I think that you're right. There should be a robust confirmation process and we will see. But until then, I'm not going to jump to conclusions and say that she is not qualified. Well, next up, we have Gary Cohn. He was the president's chief economic advisor. That was until the president announced his intentions to impose a variety of tariffs. Cohn fiercely opposed starting a trade war and stepped down not long after Trump's announcement. Levi, did Cohn make the right move? The, making the right move to leave the White House? Of course he did. Everyone is making a great move by leaving the Trump White House. As a matter of fact, anyone who wants to leave the Trump White House, please do, because it's awful, and I know you guys are having a tough time there. I think that Gary Cohn was actually a voice of reason um, in this administration, even though his policies were right, um, as I mean, like, right on the political spectrum. Um, at least he had some semblance of understanding of how the economy worked. I am concerned that no one else in the White House does. Um, and of course, Diego talked about the great tax cuts and the great economic plan that, you know, tr I wish the media would talk more about that. Well, Diego, if you guys had a communications director and a deputy communications director, maybe people would be able to talk about that. But right now, there's A, no economic policy or vision other than whatever Trump thinks up in the morning or B, no way to communicate that economic policy or vision. And I think that's why you guys are having a tough time winning a lot of these special elections, because I think people are realizing that. Go ahead and respond if you want. Uh, I think that, you know, I think that the tariffs, um, conservative, I, I'm not a proponent of tariffs. I think that if this were, you know, Fox and Friends and then the president were watching, I'd say that, you know, tariffs are a bad idea. You know, the, I think that Kona actually probably did make the right decision in this case to make a stand on tariffs. I think this is an issue which, um, you know, starting a trade war is not something the United States wants. We've had good economic growth, you know, big, l biggest, best wage, biggest, best, that's not Trump now, mm -hmm. um, best wage growth since the recession. I think the economy is doing very, very well right now, thanks in large part to the Trump administration and to Congress passing great historic tax cuts. I think that tariffs have the potential to unfortunately unravel a lot of that. We saw the you know, stock market not very receptive to it, obviously. Um, so I have very grave concerns about tariffs, and I, hopefully, the Trump administration will reconsider. Doesn't seem likely, but um, hopefully, someone on the Hill, maybe Speaker Ryan, could get Trump's ear. And do you share Diego's um, concerns on tariffs? Yeah, I definitely do. Um, I know that tariffs are a problem that both parties have. Um, it's a uh, but in both parties, there are people who are pro or against tariffs. I am against tariffs. I think that the more trade that we have makes not only America a better place, but the world a better place. It makes the world more um, united and fighting for democracy, fighting for a capitalist system. Um, but my concern comes with the president just making these decisions on a quick whim and not having really any policy or legal background to the decisions that he makes, because that only creates problems, especially now with China. And finally today, Hope Hicks. She had been the White House Communications Director, and before that, one of Trump's closest and longest serving staffers. But she too stepped down just a few weeks ago. Levi, simply put, why do you think there is so much turnover in this administration? Well, Diego earlier pointed out that the turnover is overblown. Well, Diego, let me give you a stat. 34% of this administration has already turned over. That is easily the highest number we have seen in over 40 years since this could even be recorded. So when you have a 34% turnover rate compared to the second worst, which was Ronald Reagan at 17% in his first year, yeah, it is a concern. And it's not turnover for lower level staff members, no. It is turnover for high level staff members. Right now, the deputy chief of staff in 2018, gone. You have deputy FBI director, CDC director, staff secretary, communications director, associate attorney generals, secretary of state, associate secretaries of state, 
everyone at high levels who are supposed to be keeping this administration stable are leaving. Do I, you know, give them any type of, you know, I'm not angry at them. I would leave as well. It is an awful administration to work in. But at the same time, maybe the president should consider changing some of his ways and being, you know, less whimsy and actually having something that he can stand on and believe in because maybe that would help him with his staff members to know what to do, A, and B, how to respond to things. And also the president could probably be a little bit less terrible and that would help as well. Diego, what impact do you think the turnover has? I think obviously, you know, there is something said that, you know, obviously the president, um, you know, could make improvements in, you know, his, how he sometimes treats his Twitter account, for example. I think that, you know, there are a lot of people who would agree with that on, on you know, my side of the aisle. Um, I think that, you know, the short-term effect, obviously, there's some short-term turnover chaos or what have you, if you want to put it that way, um, of you know new people coming in. I think long-term, this won't be an issue. I think that in a couple of weeks, you know, we'll be off this issue and we'll be talking as we should have been long ago about you know the good job the economy is doing and all the other good things that this administration has been doing. I just want to say real quick, Diego, the problem isn't the Twitter account; it's the person who's writing the tweets. I think it's time to understand that. Right now, we need a president who will actually lead. The problem isn't, you know, oh, he just has problems with his Twitter account. No, it's the person who's tweeting. And that will have to be the last word on that. But after this break, it's rapid fire, so stay with us. started for me out on the line outside of the Barclay Center. You know, a lot of GW alumni filtering in. I'm just so proud to be an alumni and be a part of this movement. There hasn't been a team like this in seven, eight, nine years. I'd say we probably have over a thousand people here and every, you can feel the energy. I graduated in 1991. I graduated in 2009. I graduated in 2005 from Alien School. The School of Medicine and Health Sciences. From the Columbian College. If you want a place to be in the world tonight, it's right here with all of our alumni, students, parents, friends of the George Washington University. It's just important to have a community that supports our student athletes. I love this team and I, you know, I'm proud to support it. Everyone that's participated and made this happen knows it didn't happen overnight. What we're trying to do is develop students and, and student athletes to really impact the world. This is an even better turnout than last year. The first thing it can really do for us is get our name out there. Applications the next year go through the roof. Tonight you are the George Washington University. It raises the school spirit and makes us all proud to be Colonials. And uh, you have really galvanized our whole university community. You're building a spirit and you're building a family within the university stronger than we've ever had before. Gentlemen, go out there and raise high. Raise it up. Raise high. Raise high. Win, baby. Raise it up. Raise high, the buff and blue. And our panel joins us again now for rapid fire. Some quick answers to some quick questions. Residents of Pennsylvania's 18th district took to the polls to vote in the special election to fill Tim Murphy's vacant seat in Congress. Democrat Connor Lamb won very narrowly over Republican Rick Saccone in a district that had been solid red. Diego, what does this mean to you for the 2018 midterms? Uh, I don't think it means a whole lot. I think that it is a specific race where, you know, the Democratic uh, candidate this, uh, this time, uh, you know, Mr. Lamb was very strong at it, had a very strong fundraising total, um, you know, more of a moderate mold to the district. I think that overall, I'm not concerned. I think that heading to November, the NRCC is doing a lot of great work. I think uh, Chairman Stivers has a very good team out there. I have no concern that we will lose the House. I think that American people will realize they don't want Nancy Pelosi back in the speaker chair. They don't want a Democratic Congress that will raise your taxes, who will pass uh, restrictions on your gun rights. I think that they will realize that come November, um, this is just one isolated election in a district that no longer will exist in November. I think that you know, heading forward, we are, are going to keep our majority and we are going to keep building on our Republican agenda. Levi, do you think that this election tells you anything about the upcoming midterms? Don't worry, Diego. Everything's going to be fine for them. They're going to keep the majority. Everything's going to be perfect. You know, losing in a Trump plus 20 district is amazing 
respect and confidence for our president. So, Diego, you shouldn't worry. Everything's going to be completely fine, and you know the Republicans are going to win back the House because you know the fundraising operations that was funded by grassroots donors, not any Hollywood elites like you guys like to say, that still got outspent ten to one. Connor Lamb got outspent ten to one. And a moderate that fits the district, yeah, because people who actually grow up and live in the district may understand what the district needs. And that's what Democrats across the country have been doing, is we're getting people who've grown up in the districts, who know the districts, and who are running based on the district that they lived in. So, yeah, I honestly believe that they will have some problems, but if Diego doesn't, then they'll be A-OK -okay come November. Now, next up, in the aftermath of the shooting at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School, students have been taking the nation by storm, advocating for stricter gun control measures. Additionally, Florida just passed a series of gun control measures for the first time in more than 20 years. Levi, will Congress act on gun control? You know, I'm still trying to remain as optimistic as possible. I hope so. I really, really do hope so. I think this is a really important issue, and at least a debate, at least starting to do research. I mean, we don't even, we're not even allowed to do research on gun control in Congress right now. At least that step would be important. That step would be something that America needs to further understand this epidemic. Um, but unfortunately, I don't think it will happen. Um, I think that we as activists, um, as Democrats, need to continue to push for it as much as we can. Hopefully the March for Life um, on this Saturday will help that out. Um, but if not, then um, hopefully that will be a voting issue for many people going to the polls. What do you think is going to happen on the issue of school shootings? March for Life. Yeah. Um, I think that we have seen that there are two bipartisan proposals that as, I don't know if they ended up making the final on this, they were at some point in there. Um, the uh, bill fixed next to make sure that states are required to report all information to the background checks national database. And I think that the uh, Stop School Violence Act, which Senator Hatch and a couple of a big bipartisan group of senators and congressmen has introduced, both these measures I think will pass Congress. I think they'll have an effect. I think that you know we may disagree on what the um, solution policy-wise to you know school shootings are or is, uh, but I think that this is an issue which Levi's we should be talking about. That I think that you know the president has laid out a plan that should be a starting point to talk. Um, we saw you know recently in Maryland, you know, and it, a person who attempted to shoot at the school who was stopped by an armed security guard. I think going forward we'll see a very good push to put more of those in the schools. I think that this discussion is not over. I think that I am I maybe I live in a fantasy happy world as Levi seems to be on the theme of today. Know what's going on? A little pessimistic, but um, I think yeah, well, I think we're going to have some very productive bipartisan legislation passed through Congress that will help address this issue. Now, President Trump and AG Jeff Sessions rolled out their plan to quote get tough in combating the opioid epidemic, notably proposing that federal prosecutors pursue the death penalty for major drug dealers. Diego, would that be an effective strategy? I uh, no, I do not believe so. I don't think that the the data doesn't show. Well, that that shows the death penalty is not a deterrent. I don't think that the, I don't personally believe that the government should be giving out the death penalty at all. Um, so I, I don't believe that this is the solution to the opioid epidemic. I think that there are a lot of other areas that the administration has proposed uh, to deal with the epidemic that Congress has proposed, which are you know a lot better use of resources, a lot better use of time, a lot better use of the discretion of prosecutors. I don't think the death penalty uh, should be on the table in this instance. I think that this is just talking tough that will not get results. Do you agree? Uh, everything that Diego said, but I have a more concerning point. From my understanding, I don't know what the president has done to get briefings to learn more about the opioid epidemic that led him to conclude, I think that we should put any drug dealer getting the death penalty. What makes you say that? What briefing, what information, what, in, like, what makes you say that? I'm concerned that either the information that the president is getting at the White House is extremely poor or the president is not actually taking in the information that he's getting, if he's getting any at all. So yes, it's concerning, it's alarming, um, and hopefully Congress will find better ways to deal with this epidemic, um, but you know, I'm just concerned that the president would even say something like that. All right, now finally, we are in the midst of March Madness. So, Levi, you first. Who do you have going all the way now? Who's still left? I, I still have Duke. Um, I hope they can win, I uh, think it's three or four more games to get to that championship and be able to cut down the nets this April. Diego, what about you? Who's going all the way? You know, I went to a Jesuit high school. You know, one of the things I was taught is to never uh, bet against a, you know, nun. So I think Loyola Chicago, you know, Sister Jean has a 
godly chance. You know, the final four is the day before Easter. Finals the day after Easter. I don't know. I think this is written in the stars. Loyal yeah. Chicago. Add my arm to Gloria. <laughs> Hard not through for Loyal, I gotta say. <laughs> well, with that, we end our debate here on Colonial Crossfire. Diogo Rublar, Levi DeBose, thank you so much for joining us today. When we come back, Michael Schnell has our debate fact check. Wonderful academic institution with a fine athletic prediction. Patricio Garino throws it down with two hands. Wonderful city. It's a great place to go to school. Keaton Savage open down the right side. We'll go and dunk it with his right hand. Not just a family, it's a whole community. for the Colonials. It's been pretty busy around here with parcel and flex plans going on sale, so we need an extra pair of hands around the office. Let's go, g -Dum. Let's go, g -Dum. We had no idea you were bringing the Colonial Army. Whoosh! Ah, uh, g -Dum. Uh, g -Dum. Hey, hey, George. Uh, <laughs> I think you have an update for Firefox. Never mind. <laughs> Welcome back. During our political discussion, a team of fact checkers monitor our debate, and Michael Schnell is here now to fill us in on what we missed. Michael. Thanks, Casey. Let's start with our Republican debater, Diego. One point that needs a closer look was when he said that Gina Haspel's confirmation hearing would be held in the Senate Judiciary Committee. This is incorrect. Rather, Haspel will face the Senate Intelligence Committee for her confirmation hearing. Next up, our liberal debater Levi. Levi mentioned that Congress is not permitted to conduct research on gun control right now. However, Congress would not actually do this research, the CDC would, but Congress had previously threatened to reduce funding for the CDC if they did move forward with analysis. And finally, Levi also stated that in Trump's plan to combat the opioid crisis, he said that any drug dealer will get the death penalty. This is incorrect. Trump's plan calls for only some drug dealers to receive this punishment, only the quote, big pushers, the ones who are really killing people. That's all for this edition of Colonial Crossfire Fact Check. I'm Michael Schnell. Casey, back to you. Thanks so much, Michael. And now it's time for Spilled Milk. Here's our tribute to the very best of late night political comedy. There's more news in the story of Trump campaign consulting firm Cambridge Analytica. That's a classy name, Cambridge Analytica. Not to be confused with their competitor, Oxford Thinkamups. <laughs> President Trump said today that he and Vladimir Putin will probably get together in the not-too-distant future to discuss the arms race. Oh, sorry, I misread that. It's to race into each other's arms. The ultimate penalty has to be the death penalty. Now, maybe our country's not ready for that. It's possible. It's possible that our country's not ready for that. And I can understand it, maybe. Although, personally, I can't understand that. <laughs> you know... One of my favorite things about Trump is that he has inner monologues out loud. Allow me to acknowledge the founder of this ministry, a man who became the author of an enormous body of work that has inspired millions, and he's been a friend and a mentor to me, Dr. James Dobson. Look, saying you don't support conversion therapy and then calling Dobson your mentor is like saying you're a staunch vegetarian and a law-abiding citizen. And by the way, please meet my lifelong friend and mentor, the Hamburglar. <laughs> All right, well, that'll do it for this episode of Colonial Crossfire. Make sure you check us out online at www.gw-tv.com. And be sure to follow us on Twitter and like us on Facebook. For all of us here at GWTV, I'm Casey Decker. Thanks for getting caught in the crossfire with us. We'll see you right back here next time.